um, welcome to today's virtual lecture. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Liz Veda. I'm the owner and operator of Bee Willow, and we're a boutique houseplant and local good shop uh, located in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, so we are joined today by Dr. Barbara Getch, who will be presenting her lecture entitled The Barometer of Life. We are so excited for the opportunity to learn directly from Dr. Getch, as she's the co-chair of the IUCN's CSSG, which is the Cactus and Succulent Specialist Group. As you learn more about today, the CSSG is a global authority in cacti and succulents and played a pivotal role with the repatriation of over 1,000 stolen Copiapoa cacti back to their native Chile. After her presentation, we'll have a, a question and answer session. So please leave any questions in the chat or comment on Facebook if you're watching there, and I'll bring your questions to the table during the Q&A. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Barbara Getch. My camera is not going, oh, oh there it is. <laughs> Hello, thanks so much Liz for, for the invitation to give this talk and for the presentation, the introduction. Um, it is a, glare, a great pleasure for me to be here this uh, lovely Sunday afternoon in the, in the UK uh, to talk about the barometer of life. Let me start sharing my presentation. Okay. Okay, so I am going to be talking in this uh, presentation about what I've been doing for most of my career, which is um, studying cacti and also assessing the extinction risk of plants for the IUCN Red List. So it's um, a weaved story between these two um, areas of my, of my career. Um, I am a, a botanist originally from Mexico. I specialized on cacti, as uh, Liz mentioned. I am a cactologist. We, we exist, a lot of people don't know, but yeah. Um, and um, I was 20 years old when I first fell in love with cacti. It happened in the um, uh, car park of the Faculty of Science of the National University in Mexico City. I was in, my, in the second year of my degree in biology. And of course, I, I, I thought that I was going to end up studying whales in the, in the Gulf of Baja California. And there were a few tables uh, with science books for sale. And there, between the books of calculus, maths, and physics, I saw these two books sitting there next to each other. And it was love on first sight. Las Cactáceas de México by Dr. Elia Bravo. Um, and um, I paid 300 pesos for them a um, long time ago. That's around $15, which at the time was like half my monthly um, allowance. Um, but I walk away with these two heavy volumes, knowing that I have found something really special. And until today, they travel to, with me around the world. Of course, I still have both of them. They're very heavy, so I'm not going to hold them. And it was a year after that I was um, doing my first ever um, red list assessment for the IUCN red list for a plant. And obviously, it was a cactus. Um, it was on a paper format. Um, and I, I didn't know then that I was going to end up doing thousands of assessments for the IUCN Red List. And I didn't um, quite understood either the powerful tool for conservation that the Red List was going to, to become. But I was very aware of something, that many of these plants would become extinct if I didn't do something about them. And I became determined to make a difference for the conservation, and the Red List has become my tool. Um, so at this time, it was around the year 2000, you know, when all this was um, 
uh, happening and big changes was happening also with the IUCN red list. So we started witnessing a completely new way in which red list assessments were made. This was mainly driven by the biodiversity crisis, but also by the availability of information, the means we had to store it and to analyze it. Things were changing a lot and they were changing fast. And also, um, it was when the IUCN red list categories and criteria uh, uh, got uh, reviewed. And the system was completely moved from being qualitative and subjective to being quantitative, strict, and consistent. And it moved from being simple lists of species, of names of species with a red list category, to complete databases, including species maps. So it was then that the IUCN red list became what we know it as today, the, world, the world's most comprehensive information source for the conservation status of animal, fungi, and plants. And we also call it the barometer of life. So that is the, why I named the, the talk the barometer of life, um, because it measured pressures on, on species and it helps guide conservation and prevent extinction. So while I was putting the presentation together, I thought that uh, maybe some of you have never heard of IUCN, of the IUCN Red List or the IUCN even. So I'm just going to quickly explain who IUCN is. So IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, is the world's largest and oldest conservation organization in the world. It was created in 1948, and today it has over 1,000 member organizations that, it's, uh, that are conformed by governments, agencies, NGOs in over 170 countries. It has regional office in many different parts of the world, like the office I am based in at the moment here in Cambridge, which is the Red List Unit. Uh, there's offices in the US, in Washington DC, and in many other parts of the world. And altogether, there's uh, over 1,000 members of, staffs, of staff. Um, it also has six commissions that together have over 16,000 uh, scientists and experts affiliated. And the commission that is more important for the IUCN Red List is the Species Survival Commission because they, um, they is a commission that, that holds all the specialist groups of IUCN. There's over 80 different specialist groups. Uh, the cactus and succulent plants specialist group is one of many. There's, uh, it's either by um, species or for example, the cactus or orchids. Uh, there's also um, by themes like medicinal plants or crop or relatives and also by regions like the Madagascar plant specialist group, for example. And together they have around 10,000 experts uh, that are members of these groups. And they are the ones that feed a lot of the information that we use in red list assessments. And we also have many partners that make the red list possible, that uh, provide guidance, uh, leadership, and resources. Um, many, you know, based in, in different parts of the world, in a specific for plants, um, uh, Q here in the UK is very important, Missouri Botanical Gardens in the US. Um, well, that was just like a brief overview of IUCN so that you knew who IUCN was in case you have not heard of IUCN before. And uh, now I'm gonna dive a little bit into um, uh, cacti, just to give like a general explanation what cactus are and why I think they're possibly the most amazing plants on the planet. <laughs> uh, so, Cacti are succulent plants. Succulent plants are basically plants that hold water. And uh, the main ways or uh, that this is done is through holding this uh, water in their stems, like cactus do, or in their leaves, like uh, agaves and aloe vera do, that you can see the, the two different examples in, in the picture. And this has been an adaptation 
um, uh, that these plants have um, um, undergone through millions of years as a response to the environments where they grow. Even though we can find uh, succulent plants in many different kinds of ecosystems, I would say possibly in every single ecosystem, but the permanent ices um, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the world, the highest diversity are, is found in the arid and semi-arid regions uh, of the world um, of succulent plants because cacti are endemic to the Americas. That's very important, but I'm going to touch up on, on this um, uh, later. Um, so looking at the cactus family in a specific, they are characterized by not having leaves, even though there's some species of cacti that have leaves. In biology, we always find exceptions to everything. So there's exceptions, even though most of the species don't have leaves. They have long living fleshy stems. They bear spines, uh, even though there's some species that don't have spines, like the Lophophora that you can see in the middle of the picture. And the way that they grow is very different to normal plants. Normal plants that you can see in the last uh, little illustration here in my slide, usually have a, a shoot or an apical meristem where they grow from. from. Cacti have areoles, and areoles are those little dots that I don't know. Can you see my mouse on the on the screen? Yes. Okay. So are these little dots where the the spines grow from? From so from these areoles they grow spines, wool, hairs, the flowers, and this is what allow them to grow in such wonderful and unique and weird shapes. And also something that I find truly fascinating is that succulent plants and well, cacti present something that is called crassulation acid metabolism or CAM photosynthesis. And in a nutshell, what this is, is basically, as you probably know, uh, plants um, exchange gas, right? Like carbon dioxide goes in, oxygen goes out. And most plants do this during the day. But because cacti grow in such hot environments, if they did this during the day, this gas exchange is done through something um, that it's called stomata, which is um, similar to the pores that we have on the skin. So they open up their stomata to carry, on the, to carry uh, out the gas exchange. If they did this during the day, they would probably dehydrate in no time. So they have adapted to do this during the night. Aren't they awesome? <laughs> and one, one of the things I really find fascinating is the diversity of shapes and forms that you can find in this uh, uh, plant family. You can see this massive tree-like uh, plant, which is actually a cactus in Brazil. I am there in the red jumper, standing at the base of it. Pretty, pretty amazing. Or this in, 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 the, in the center is in the Tehuacanqui Catalan region in Mexico. It's at the Pecho. They are six to seven meters high and they form forest, forest of cactus. They're beautiful. Uh, so you find these giants of several hundred thousand kilograms and you find these little tiny things like the last uh, picture that's Blosfeldia lilliputana, an Argentinian species, that's a fully grown specimen. And when they are um, adults, they're only as big as the finger tip of your nail. That's a fully grown uh, plant. So the variety is just amazing. Um, and just to show you uh, how how, how, how great it is to go and look for these plants in the desert. I want you to see if you can spot, there's four cactus or four cacti on this picture. I don't know if you found them and I don't know if you have found them, but there you go. They're there, you can barely see them. This is an Ariocarpus cochubellanus. It's one of my favorite species. And you usually find them in areas in the desert that look like dry lakes, that there's been water there at some point and then it dries and there's only mud. 
and these things grow like right on the on the ground and you can just about see them it's very easy to miss them but they look like little stars like little stars that have fallen from the sky and obviously when they are flowering they are more uh, they're way easier to spot um, and that, that is one of the reasons why cactus uh, fascinates so many people because they produce beautiful flowers. So, so now going back to the red list. Uh, so I'm going to explain in the next slides how is it that we do all, this, all, all these things that we clean. You know, like to claim that um, that it's the world's most comprehensive source of extinction risk of species is really something to say. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's not just a list, but a compilation of the conservation status of the species at the global level, and is based on the base, be, best scientific information. And it's widely used to inform and influence conservation around the world. Um, as I mentioned, it's a database and it includes information on threats, ecological requirements of the species and conservation actions that are in place and also needed. And thousands of um, the world leading scientists uh, participate in this process. And I explain how through the different specialist groups of the SSC that is possible. And basically, the Red List works as an online scientific journal. It's a peer review publication. So how do we do this? How do we make this, um, this such an, an amazing conservation tool? Um, so before I go into, into that, I just wanted to touch base on the IUCN Red List categories and criteria, because it's important to understand that the, the way we, the, the, the IUCN Red List is now, we not only include threatened species, we include every species that we assessed using the, the categories and criteria, and some of those, you know, there's only th uh, three threat categories, critically endangered, endangered um, and vulnerable, but we also have species that are, um, that based on the be best available information, do not meet the criteria to be listed on a threatened category, but those are also included on the IUCN red list. So it's funny because the name is very misleading. It's called the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. And it's not a list, it's not red, and it's not a threatened species. <laughs> but it is the old name, and we kept it, because that's how most people uh, know it. And again, I'm not going to go into the technicalities of how we assess uh, the extinction risk of species. We, there's, um, there's training available online for free, if you're interested in, in to, to know further about this. And usually to learn to use the red list cat, uh, categories and criteria, we, we also run like three day workshops where we go in through all these in details. But basically for today, what you need to understand is that uh, we use uh, data on population. If uh, we need to look at, at if this population is re uh, being reduced somehow, and data on the distribution range of species. And we have three, uh, four, five different uh, criteria that we usually assess species against, uh, depending on the quantity and quality of information that we have. So, the, there's many different ways in which to assess um, the extinction risk of species, but possibly the most effective one is through expert workshops. Uh, so basically, these are workshops that are organized uh, with a focus on a taxonomic group, um, and you invite uh, well-known world recognized experts on these species. These workshops um, usually last five days and we go through something between 250 to 350 species. We go species by species. 
and you divide your experts in, in, in working tables. And the process is just magical because a lot of the people, uh, you know, when you start a workshop, always think like, we don't have all the information that we need to assess the extinction risk. And we might not have the information published, but having the experts that work with these species in the field gives so much information. So we refer to this usually as the great literature. And the, for example, population on species um, uh, data on, uh, on species populations is uh, very scarce. Not a lot of, of, of species have that population, but the experts can really tell you if it's a common species, if it's a scarce species, if it's a species that it's uh, probably triggering one of the threatened categories, they can tell you, you know, like, are there a hundred individuals left in the field or less? They'll probably have a very good um, estimate of, of the number. So expert knowledge is um, very important. The other very important information that we usually uh, can only get from experts is uh, information on the threats to the species. What is affecting these this, uh, species in the field? And um, is the same with uses. Ecological data, you usually can find that in, um, in the literature more easily. Uh, so it's a, an, an intensive process and you basically are they're sitting with these experts asking them questions. And at the end of the workshop, um, you, well, during the workshop, you have the experts and you have very experienced IUCN uh, facilitators. So people that know the category and criteria really well. And with the experts, you apply the methodology and you, know, uh, you come to a, to a final category for the red list. The, um, the other very important piece of information that you gather from workshops and that it's um, it was one of the big changes with when the IUCN uh, changed its standards is the need for maps. Why are maps important? Because if we want to conserve something, we need to know where it is. In the case of cactus, again, I'm going to start mixing my, my cactus story here. Uh, I, I, I mentioned to you that these are plants endemic to the American continent. Uh, that is, they occur naturally in the Americas and nowhere else in the world. But that endemism happens at many different levels. So for example, in Mexico, we have uh, around 600 species of cactus of which 75% are present in Mexico and nowhere else in the world. And within Mexico, you find the highest diversity of cacti in the Chihuahuan Desert. We have around 300 species, of which around 70% occur in the Chihuahuan Desert and nowhere else in the world. So all these little polygons that you see in here represent the areas where these cactus are. Um, and I think it's amazing because before we started evaluating these species for the IUCN red list, we didn't have maps. It's amazing how little maps um, available for plants there, there are. And there's also the fact that um, there is a lot of information scattered in big databases, information from uh, field work, you know, like uh, botanists usually go in the field and you register where the species occurs with your GPS, you have the coordinates, you have an environment voucher. And that is represented by a point. Um, there's big, big, big databases, but what the IUCN red list does is that all that information is gathered in one place. And during the workshop process, all that information is curated and verified by the experts. So you end up with very high quality information. Um, and this level of endemism happens, you know, like uh, Mexico is the country with the highest diversity of cactus, around 600, I, I, I said. 
The next country is Brazil with just over on, under 300. And it has, um, um, how, 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 Brazil, again, 74% of the species are endemic. The US have 166 species of, one, of which um, the US, I made my notes, 27% are endemic. So this also makes them very vulnerable to extinction. So um, before we conducted the global cactus assessment, we knew because of these, because we go out in the field and we only find them in very small areas, that they were possibly very threatened with extinction. And this is also one of the, of the reasons why they're so appealing for collectors, is uniqueness. And, and, and rarity in terms of their distribution and sometimes their numbers. Why, what do I mean by that? That you not only find them in small places, but sometimes you also find them in very small numbers, right? So it's something like very appealing for people that look for, for unique things, namely specialized collectors. So, at the end of all this process of assessing the extinction risk of, of a species, what you have in the IUCN red list is actually a little story. I mentioned before the IUCN red list was just a list with, with species names and categories, but that didn't give us more information. We didn't know why a species was, was listed under the category it was listed. Today, we have all that information. And we have very good justifications of why a species is listed as it is. So for example, if you go in the IUCN red list and you look for the saguaro, which is a, probably the most well-known cactus, you're gonna find its map. It's gonna say that it's this concern and it's gonna tell you why. The species has such a wide range that even though in some of the area, in some, in some areas of its range is decreasing, it still doesn't trigger any uh, threat, uh, threatened category. It tells you who provided the information. So all the, all the credit is given to the experts, who reviewed the assessment and who compiled, who applied the, the IUCN red list categories and criteria. It also tells you the date when the species was assessed. And this is very important because now I know, for example, that for the saguaro and for most of the cactus, we need to reassess them now. This process needs to be repeated periodically. And what happens is that then you end up with two different points in, in time of, of, the, of the assessment and you can see uh, the trend uh, the, the species is, you know, is it becoming less threatened because of conservation actions or more threatened? Um, so for me, every time I start organizing a workshop, it's like if I was setting sail to unknown, unknown lands. Uh, in the same way that each assessment tells you a story, the whole process of evaluating complete groups, namely the cactus family or the allos of Madagascar or the Crowell relatives of Mesoamerica, those are some, uh, those are some of the projects that I've been involved. At the end of, 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 the, of the process, um, you have a very interesting story to tell. So much data is put together um, that didn't exist before, that really helps to guide conservation. Um, so before completing the global cactus assessment, during this process, we map almost 1,500 species of cactus. Before we could imagine these maps, the patterns of diversity. And after this assessment, it was the first time that we could actually see, you know, like the different patterns were the main centers of, we knew it was in the Chihuahua Desert, but where exactly? And we were also able to see the different hotspots of threatened species. Where in the world are these? Um, the main center was found in, 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 southern, in southern Brazil. It was also the first time that a plant group was compared to all the vertebrate groups because vertebrates have been assessed before for the IUCN red list. And this, 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 I'm not going to go into this, but um, 
it's part of the problem uh, of the uh, problem that we have um, related to time blindness that plants don't get as much attention as animals. But it was the first time that we could compare them, and it was the first time also that we realized that cacti were were more threatened than birds and mammals. Uh, and we could compare them to the rest of the other groups uh, that had been assessed, uh, complete, uh, complete groups that had been assessed for the IUCN red list. And this is uh, one of the very powerful tools of using the SEND methodology, and that this methodology can be used across any taxonomic uh, group, any living organism that you, you're dealing with, except bacteria. Um, and it was at the time when we published the results, it was the fifth more threatened uh, group after cycads, which are also plants, amphibians, conifers, and corals. And another very uh, important uh, uh, bit of information that comes out is that you can actually see where the different threats to these species are happening. And why is this important? Because knowing which species is threatened by what threat and where allows you to plan conservation in a much more effective way. Um, through this process, we also, we always knew that cacti were widely utilized by people. They are very important for, uh, for human uh, livelihoods in the areas where they grow naturally. Uh, but we didn't know the exact number of species that were utilized. So this, the global practice assessment, um, you know, um, through this process, we realized that we realize that 57% of species are utilized in some form. And a very high number of species are utilized for the ornamental trade. And at least 202 threatened cactus are sourced from the wild for horticultural purposes, that is for specialized collections. And these were the results that made it to the news, <laughs> and I'll come to this in, in a minute. Oh, in this slide, before I move, do you know that, even though this is not from uh, wild um, cactus, these, are, these come from cultivated cactus, most of the red pigment in uh, pharmaceutical industry, cosmetic, cosmetic industry, and food industry comes from this insect, here that is called the, the cochineal insect that produces a red pigment. So a few years back, um, they realized that red pigment was uh, carcinogenic, so that it caused cancer and they prohib prohibited it. And they started using this um, insect that feeds on, on opuntias, which is a species of, of cactus, to dye things red. Uh, but this is not new. This was used by um, uh, the, 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 in pre-Hispanic times in, this, in, the, in, in Oaxaca, in the state of Oaxaca of, of, in, in Mexico. You can find some of the pyram pyramids in Mitla stained by uh, cochineal insect. And in Mexico, we eat cactus. They are a very important part of our diet. They are delicious and they are very highly nutritious as well. And many of the fruits of many species are, are, are used. Um, so all the results of, the, of these massive efforts uh, of the Global Cactus Assessment uh, were published on a high impact paper. As you can see by the list of uh, co-authors, uh, it was a, a massive effort uh, to put all this information together. And yeah, High impact papers are nice from the academic point of view, but what is very important is that they also catch the attention of the media. And when we publish the results that many of the of cacti were threatened by, by extinction, 31% of, of species were under threat, it made it to the news everywhere in different parts of the world. And this is very important because it raises awareness among people, not um, 
raises awareness. Oh, hmm. okay. I, I'm missing a slide, but it doesn't matter. It raises awareness not only about the fact that, um, you know, when, when you talk about extinction, people, they don't associate extinction risk with plants. So that was very important. And on top of that, they don't associate illegal trade with plants either. So it was like um, a double raising awareness uh, when these results came, came out. And until today, the impact of this paper um, is still ongoing. I, I very often get um, uh, requests for, for interviews to talk about the illegal trade of taxes. And maybe you, you saw last week this uh, piece in the New York Times. It was published on the 20th of May. And I want to use it to, uh, to, to tell you why it's so important to um, raise awareness. So basically through the cactus paper, the one that I, the, the, the one that I showed before, Jared Margulis, who is uh, Lee's friend, um, that caught his attention. He saw somewhere in the media that cactus were uh, poached, that they were illegally collected. And he started researching on that. And they started talking to Liz. Well, Jared started talking to Liz. Liz became very interested in the topic, given that she owns a plant shop. And we, um, uh, we started a partnership um, you know, part of her sales uh, from cacti and other plants go towards the conservation uh, work of, this, of the specialist group. And it was just amazing because we, we, we had been working for almost a year in this uh, seizure of over a thousand Chilean cactus in Italy. And uh, after a year, we only just started coming with the, in the partnership with Liz. And after jumping through every sorts of hoops from the Italian government and the Chilean government to send these plants back to Chile, um, as uh, my colleague and member of the special of the Cactus and Succulent Plant Specialist Group, Andrea Catabriga, was packing the plants in Italy, he realizes that he has more boxes <laughs> than we anticipated and that we were short of funding to send the plant back to Chile and everything was set up to, to happen. This was during the weekend on a Thursday and the chipping company had arranged already to pick up the plants on the Monday. So we were basically on a pickle and all of a sudden I remember lease through Jared's talk on illegal trade of cactus, raise funds. And, you know, she wanted to use them for conservation. So I basically just sent her an email. It's just like, Liz, we are in this trouble. We are short of money to send the cactus back to, to Chile. And she was over the moon. She could not believe the impact that she's making on the illegal trade of cacti by fighting her little corner from her amazing shop, Big Willow. So thank you, Liz, for that. <laughs> um, and talking about illegal trade, I'm very often asked about what, what can we do about it? Um, illegal trade of and poaching of cacti is, uh, is not an easy uh, problem to tackle. And I think that possibly maybe looking into the sustainable use of some of these plants, uh, better law enforcement, uh, continue on the exit to propagation and raising awareness and on, on responsible purchase of plants are the way forward. Um, but yeah, it's 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 difficult because we to implement and do more research and and, and, and our work when the funds are so limited for plant conservation. Um, and uh, no, it's not that one. Next slide. Okay, and um, in other ways that we use the red list information. So to, to uh, guide uh, conservation, uh, this plant, the Mamillaria herrera, 
beautiful little golf uh, ball, endemic to a very small region in the state of Querétaro in Mexico, highly sought, up, sought after by uh, collectors, almost driven to extinction. Um, the Botanical Garden, Jardín Botanico Regional de Cadereyta, uh, has been working for many years now on this critically endangered um, species, propagating it, propagating it and making it available to the market so that people don't go and collect the plant from the, from the field. And thanks to their conservation efforts, this plant is still in the wild today. And I think Emiliano, the director of the garden, is in the in the talk today. Thank you. So, why is it important to to assess the extinction risk of species? Because we really do gather the best um, information possible to assess um, the extinction risk of species, and this information is used to carry out analysis like all the all all the data that i showed the maps and, and and all that that comes from the iucn red list it helps us to plan conservation and set priorities it also helps us to influence international policy for example in the last assessment that i conducted um or well participated in assessing um, joshua trees and agaves we're going to propose many of those species to be included in CITES because they are being affected by international trade. Um, when a species is assessed for the IUCN red list, it can influence funding allocations. There's a lot of granting mechanisms that only work on, on species that are on the red list. And it also helps um, to on the decision-making process for the private sector. So all those maps are used to um, help the private sector to, to do better practices, not put a mining, uh, a mining um, project in a place where there are endemic plants, for example. Um, and again, education and public awareness. This is Another of the questions I very often get, why should we care about cactus? You know, like they're just, they're out in the desert, nobody sees them. Well, these plants are very important for the ecosystems where they grow. They are a source of, for, of shelter, food and water for many species. And um, I really, 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 um, refuse to think that these plants that have taken millions of years to adapt and give way to some of the most wonderful organisms in the planet end up being part of a private collection. Um, I have dedicated most of my life to study cacti and to protect them, uh, do conservation. And I will probably carry on doing that for the rest of my life, if I am lucky. Um, because I truly think that a world with cactus is a better world. Cut me in the Chihuahuan desert when I used to do field work. And just a couple of slices to wrap up. Going back to the concept of the barometer of life, in the last years, we really have been bumping up, like working really hard to include more plants on the red list. Uh, today, we have around 13% of all plant species assessed for the IUCN red list, of which around 40% are threatened with extinction. So we still have a lot of work to do in terms of conservation and in terms of assessment. And uh, what can you do? I think if, um, if people really realize how amazing plants are, they would care more about them. Um, I, I really find it difficult um, for people to care about something that they don't know. So I invite you to be curious about plants. 
We depend on plants so much. Plants are in our everyday life in so many ways. The clothes that you're wearing are made of cotton, which is a plant. The seed that your coffee in the morning or your tea is made out of a plant. The bread is made out of the seed of a plant. Your house is made of the wood out of a tree. So be also very grateful for plants. Uh, you can also support plant awareness by you know, if you inform yourself, then you can start spreading the word as well. And um, you can also support um, the conservation of plants, uh, either by supporting institutions that do plant conservation or businesses like this is business that supports organizations that do plant conservation and purchase responsibly. So by attending this talk today, uh, you are going to be supporting the conservation work that we do for the Cactus and Supplement Plant Specialist Group. So thank you very much for supporting plant conservation. Um, you can follow the specialist group on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can also visit our uh, web page and you can visit, this is the, the address of the IUCN red list. Um, I was going to do a live presentation of the red list, but things can go wrong. So I, <laughs> I decided not to. And um, we are very grateful for our partner, B. Willow, and our host institution, the Desert Botanical Gardens. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Barbara. That was so informative and yeah, I definitely learned even more about this topic. So I'm super appreciative of you and your time to teach us. Um, so we did have one question, which was, um, someone was asking, they thought a lot of cacti might be endemic to South Africa. Um, and that's why so many presentations are about trips to South Africa. So is that true? Um, might they be thinking of euphorbias? What's your thought on that? Um, they're probably thinking about phonophyton and isoasis and South Africa is, uh, has a very rich uh, flora of succulent plants, but not cacti. Um, yes, especially kind of like um, in terms of diversity is the, the, our homologous from the Americas in Africa. Uh, but not cacti because they are only endemic uh, to to the American continent. Uh, you can find them introduced in, in different parts of Africa. They're actually quite problematic invasive species. But yeah, there's a lot of tours that, uh, that are organized to visit populations. And uh, actually, it's really sad because South Africa is really suffering at the moment with illegal trade as well, poaching of their succulent plants. So we, we not only share the diversity, but also the threats. Great, totally. Um, a good question just came in. What are the plans for the cacti that were sent back to Chile? So uh, on the um, social networks, it, it has been circulated uh, that they are going to be reintroduced. Um, however, that's quite difficult. Um, it could, it, could be done if the information from the plants is complete. You know, we need to know exactly the, the place where those plants were, were from. Uh, but they have to go through a very strict uh, quarantining regime in Chile. Uh, myself, I really doubt that they are going to be reintroduced in the wild. They will probably have to be um, sent to different national collections in Chile. Yeah. That's crazy. Like that's that you know, one point two million dollars worth of plants in the black market. That's it's terrible. Yeah, it's, it's mind blowing. Um, another question for you: uh, What is your advice to plant buyers? For example, is there an accepted certification or other way to determine if a plant for sale is nursery grown or at least not wild collected? Uh, so, my colleague and friend, Jared Margulis, gave a very interesting um, 
talk um, on this particular topic um, a, a few months back, two months uh, back, right, Liz? Yeah, so you can watch that and you can get a lot of information. But what I can tell you basically is there is not a scheme. There's some certified, uh, there's some nurseries that sell uh, threatened species that have full certification. There are very little, uh, there are very few of them. Um, but if you're going to buy, um, you know, like if it's a threatened species, I would be very cautious. I would uh, something that it's on the red list or something like that. If you are very tempted to buy it, ask what the origin of the plant is and the seller should be able to tell you. And if it's something that it's from the wild, please don't buy it because it's really affecting wild populations. Definitely. And yeah, I think um, their question to me just really points to something that should exist, especially for, you know, us, we are within the horticultural industry, but we have no standards or really anything to operate within to let us know as buyers that, you know, the plants are not grown in the wild, you know, so we stick to people who are selling just cultivated plants and just by the nature of what species they are and the way they're grown and the way they look, we can feel confident that, that, they, um, that they're okay and that they're cultivated. But yeah, it's definitely a very important question and something that I think needs to happen in order for this industry to continue, especially as it's a growing industry, so. Yeah, I think, I think a label, you know, like a green label um, as we do with fair trade products and you know, um, Rainforest Alliance products and so on, we could have a labeling system that allows the buyer to know the, that it's an ethically sourced plant. Definitely. Yeah, and I think your point before of, you know, these are plants that are not widely cultivated, so they are rare. So if you see something, especially online, that's not often found in your garden centers, there's probably a reason for that. Yeah, I think this is more of a problem like in countries of origin and, and definitely, you know, like if you're buying online, a wild collected specimen is going to be quite expensive most of the time. Yeah. Definitely. Um, well, one question I had um, previously, which you answered in our last conversation, which I thought was so interesting was, um, you know, what are the limitations to um, the red list in terms of getting that data on the ground of measuring populations and everything and how can the average person get involved in that but then what are potentially some of the issues that can arise um, through citizen science okay, so how people can get involved in red listing is that exactly yeah so basically any person with the uh, knowledge on the species could um, assess that's it. <laughs> someone, someone has a dog and it's not <laughs> muted. It's not, I don't have dogs. <laughs> it's okay. Let's go with the dog. Uh, so, so yeah, any person with, with knowledge, but as I mentioned, it's, it's like a peer review process. So that assessment would, will have to be reviewed by one of, the, for example, if it's someone doing an assessment of a cactus, that assessment, and he's not a member of the specialist group, that assessment would end up with us to review that the information is correct and the red list categories and criteria are uh, applied properly. Um, yeah, there was one added point to that that we were talking about previously that I just thought was so interesting, which was your example of a type of rare monstera that was not even a recognized species and within what was it like a week of it being identified it went extinct yes yes so the importance of not away, uh, localities of of threatened species yes that is um i gave another presentation not long ago last week and um yeah someone brought that up you know is it really a benefit that you get the media attention on the illegal trade? Does that make the plants more vulnerable? And my response was like, I think the benefits of making people aware of the illegal trade is, it's, would be greater in terms of conservation. What I wouldn't recommend is to um, 
give the, 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 the information on the locality. For example, all the critically endangered and endangered cactus maps are not published on the red list for this reason, right? We cannot make them publicly available only for, for research and conservation purposes. It's a way of protecting the plants. And in terms of citizen science, yes, um, you know, is 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 the same. It, some of it is very valuable data. We use it sometimes to to complete our our maps, but I wouldn't recommend that people make localities of threatened plants available. No, yeah, definitely not. Um, I guess one last question I had um, in terms of these. Um, meetups with the experts to assess, um, you know, specific species or genuses. How often does that happen? And um, I guess what kind of challenges do you have with that in terms of, let's say, funding or, you know, just what kind of limitations you might experience? <laughs> I guess funding is the eternal limitation. Uh, you have to do a lot of fundraising to, to organize these uh, uh, workshops. Um, and um, they happen, you know, uh, for example, now we're planning in reassessing the whole cactus family. Uh, it's gonna take less workshops this time round because we have all the base information. So we're really hoping that it's going to be easier and we we'll probably need three workshops, but we need to, to call to partners, institutions and get the interest uh, of people to fund this work and in terms of prioritizing there are different initiatives we just you know sometimes it's just driven by the interest of the donor you know there's some donors that would uh, that are interested I don't know in funding conservation work on crop relatives or medicinal plants so then you plan around that and there's some some groups that are very kind of um, like assessing all cactaceae came as a priority from IUCN, right? So even though all the fundraising was done by myself and the research group I was in, um, it was very helpful to have the, the, the backup of IUCN to, to move the process forward. Awesome. Well, um, what's the best way to reach you in case anyone has follow-up questions? Oh, email. I didn't put my email. Barbara.getch at IUCN.org. Yes, I don't know if it's if if there's an easy way to share it, Liz, or Barbara dot Okay. Or if you if, if people go to the to the specialist group uh, web page, there's a contact us link there. Cool. Yes. Awesome. Well, just so everyone knows, all of your um, tickets that you um, gave us today for this lecture uh, go straight to the CSSG, and we raised about two hundred dollars today through this lecture. So it really does. Um, give proof that small amounts can really pull together and, and result in something great. So um, I don't have, I wish I had the totals for um, how much we've raised um, since the March date, um, but I will get that to you shortly and this will all be included in it. So yeah, we are just so thrilled to be able to play a part um, with this and helping to aid conservation through the sale of plants. So thank you so much and yeah, have a great day everyone. Yeah, thank you so much to everyone that attended today, particularly the people based in the UK, because it's such a wonderful, um, beautiful weather out there. So, yeah, thank you so much. And um, just one last note, uh, I see a question in the chat. Um, this will all be recorded, so it's being recorded right now, and it'll be available on our YouTube, as well as our Instagram TV and our Facebook. So you'll be able to watch this later if you'd like, or share with others. Thank you. Thank you, Lise. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Bye.